much discussed over a number of years. Sometimes we've had um, a little bit of information come forward. Um, it's, this is titled Piece of the Puzzle Dairy Beef and I think we're out going to be in a position over the next 40 minutes to probably come away uh, much better informed by bringing together this panel. So I will introduce um, our um, facilitator for this um, panel, Dr Sarah, Sarah Bolton, who's the Dairy Beef and Animal Welfare Manager at Greenham. Um, graduated from the University of Melbourne Vet School in 2012 and held roles in private and government veterinary practice as well as the National Animal Welfare Leader D Dairy Australia prior to joining a current role. Sarah's previous experience in the dairy farm management in calf rearing completed a Nuffield scholarship on surf surplus dairy calves and cow-calf separation in 2018 and is undertaking, currently undertaking a part-time PhD in surplus calf management and public trust preservation. Passionate about finding ways in which the industry practices can evolve to be socially acceptable, economically viable and environmentally sustainable into the future. So this, this group and this panel, um, the discussion comes at a pretty ideal time following much of the last two days. So I welcome Sarah and her team onto the stage. It's a cast of thousands. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. Uh, pleasure to be here, everyone, um, and it gives me great pleasure to be sharing the stage um, with some people who share quite a bit of expertise in this space as well. So we've been asked to have a discussion about the idea of sustainable dairy beef supply chains with a focus on how genetics and decision making can impact the sustainability of uh, dairy beef as an industry. And so I guess that concept of sustainability is, is usually how I like to frame these conversations. And of course, sustainability, not just being limited to environmental sustainability, but the other two key pillars being economic viability, because of course, sustainability literally means our ability to keep existing and economics is core to that. Um, and the other piece of the puzzle being social acceptability, because we know now that the importance of maintaining our social license as an industry is core to our sustainability. And that is essentially what's different in this space now compared to 10 or 20 years ago. I quite often get asked the question, or, you know, it's often rather a statement, oh, you know, these dairy beef supply chains and this idea has come and gone, and as soon as the bottom falls out of the beef market, you know, things disappear and they go away again. And I guess the focus of today's conversation is really about going forward from here. We know that simply relying on uh, decision-making that relates only to economic viability is genuinely going to compromise the future of our industry going forward. We can't go back to high rates of early life slaughter in our surplus calves or we genuinely risk not having an industry. So the question then becomes, in the face of continuing volatile seasonal and commodity price environments, how do we continue to raise calves surplus calves for dairy beef production and direct them away from early life slaughter, despite um, certain times being more difficult to do that in a way that pays returns than at other times. So I'm joined by Brad, Gil Brad Gilchrist, who um, is filling in for Joe Holloway today, but he's a reasonable replacement in that he is the global beef manager uh, for CMEX, so I think he'll know what he's talking about. We also have Cameron Renshaw, who works for Fulton Market Group in their dairy beef team um, and has a wealth of experience when it comes to rearing dairy beef calves. Um, and Jessica Lockland, who is my colleague at Greenham. Jess is the livestock supply chain manager for Greenham. Uh, who I recently joined only two and a half weeks ago as, as the Dairy Beef and Welfare Manager. So um, we do all work together in various capacities, but the focus of this conversation is really about how does that actually benefit the viability of supply chains going forward. So I'm going to ask each of our panel members to give a brief introduction of themselves and their perspective on this particular topic, and then we'll have a combination of questions that I have of my own, questions from the crowd, please, either via the microphone or Slido. Brad. Okay, so I guess I get to start. Uh, as uh, Sarah mentioned, I'm a fill-in here for Joe, so no matter what shoes Joe is wearing, they're always big shoes to fill, so I, uh, I'll do my best here today. Um, I, so I do work at the head office there in CMEX in Canada. 
um, and I look after the beef program there. Um, a lot of what we're doing now in, in global markets around the world is talking about these supply chains. Um, and my background, I guess I come from a beef background. We have about a 150 Angus cow-calf operation where we market those cattle through two genetic sales right off the farm. Um, we've also recently incorporated a small abattoir into our operation um, and, and at the same time work for CMEX. Um, so I think from a, an industry standpoint, I'm fairly rooted in the, in the beef industry and, and a lot of the issues that we're seeing in this beef on dairy supply chains really stems back to the genetic side of it. Um, and a lot of the problems that we have can be solved through the genetics and improved genetics that we're going to use. And I think we'll touch base on that in a little bit. But uh, just to give a bit of a background about myself, that, that's, that's where we're coming from. Thank you. Um, so my background uh, kind of entered the dairy industry 15 years ago, um, particularly in the heifer management space and adjustment and growing heifers out. And that kind of led me down the path from about 2014, where I saw the need to start to add some value to our clients' heifers that we were doing repro programs on where we would be running Jersey bull teams as mop-ups um, and you just knew that there was zero value once those heifers were returned. From there, we started to then add beef into our bottom end programs and then that morphed into me keeping a fairly close eye on some global trends um, and, and work that I was doing with Brad early on uh, from about 2015 where we knew that the Australian industry would start to make this transition. Um, and when we looked at the industry and try and broke down some of the bottlenecks. Obviously, calf rearing was one of them, calf rearing on farm, but then also third party commercial calf rearing. And that's where we invested. Um, and I've spent probably the last five years of, of my life building and understanding commercial calf rearing um, on the day to day basis, but then also broadening out my scope of network up and downstream within the supply chain. So, everything from genetics and then all the way through to people like Greenham's and the major packers that everyone would recognise in this room in the beef, um, on the beef sector. And then that found me um, kind of make a transition out of my former role at Carflink and then move into some work that I'm doing with Fulton Market Group where not a lot of people in the room would even have ever heard of Fulton Market Group, but we kind of sit above the Greenham's and the O'Connor's and the JBS's of the world and service um, one of the significant fast food restaurant chains globally uh, as their consolidated procurement um, kind of arm of their business. So um, it's, it's good to be here today. Um, this panel, I think, is good that we've got a full supply chain um, skill set and network. So hopefully, if you've got questions, please shoot them up to us. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Uh, so, Sarah mentioned my name's Jess Laughlin. I'm the Livestock Supply Chain Manager for Greenham. Uh, what that means is, essentially, I, I look after, basically, things livestock-related that aren't the direct purchasing of cattle. So, looking at really how we future-proof um, our livestock supply chain to service the needs of our customers um, So and, and also keep our plants running. So, a lot of my time over the past couple of years since I joined Greenham has been working in this dairy beef space. We see it as a real opportunity, um, you know, for sourcing really good quality cattle that meet the needs of our, um, our customers around the globe, um, but also broadly around the sustainability of our supply chains. Uh, my background is very much in beef processing, so I've spent most of my career in that space, as well as um, did spend some time with Meat and Livestock Australia in their meat standards team as well, working around eating quality, um, but actually come from an urban background. So was attracted into the industry purely from a love of uh, livestock and, and large animals and, you know, really excited by, uh, I suppose, all, all the opportunities and challenges that we had to solve on a daily basis. So sort of bring that perspective to, um, you know, how, how we can continue to um, address what that very needy future consumer may be looking for, but in a practical manner on farm. Thanks, Jess. So we're going to go into questions now. Don't worry, I have a few pre-prepared. Um, but burning questions from the audience, please feel free to put them into Slido or, of course, there is the microphone up the back. Um, but the first question that I have for everyone is that one of the things that I think is really interesting about dairy beef production from a genetic decision-making perspective is that traditionally dairy farmers um, have always seen the impact of their genetic selection when it comes to how replacement heifers are 
are bred. So you decide what the genetic makeup of replacement heifers is going to be, they perform in the herd, you feel the direct impacts of that, particularly when it comes to production. But of course, dairy beef is different because these animals are going to leave the farm at some point and whether that's, you know, pre-rearing, it's at weaning, it's at feedlot entry or perhaps even as the finished animal, that final piece of the puzzle that really answers the question of what impact does my uh, breeding decisions have on the production of these animals is often not directly seen at the level of the dairy farm. So in an environment where we are already starting to experience softening beef prices, what is the effects of that when it comes to the viability of supply chains of not having that visibility of decision making? Brad, we'll start with you. I'll go first again, I guess. Okay. It's the hot seat here, sit beside Sarah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think again, I, you know, the genetics really is what drives the conversation and um, we've looked at a lot of data now across a number of different markets to, to see what that data is telling us. Um, and so far what we've seen in, in different calf rearing facilities and, and watching these cattle right through to harvest is that the, the genetic component, the same as the top half of the herd when we look at the dairy side of it, the, the genetic component of these beef calves is significant. Um, we're, we're watching, you know, male calves finish out quite a bit faster than female calves. Um, when we look at average EBVs, and, and I, you know, I don't want to get too much into this because I, I realize that's probably a, an in-depth conversation about beef genetics, which is a little bit different than dairy genetics. But the, uh, the EBVs, if we look at average EBVs compared to top 10% EBVs, um, we can also see another 20 days um, to harvest earlier than than if we're just selecting on average. So what I'm trying to say is no matter what the trade is that we're looking at, whether it's beef or whether it's dairy, we can have significant economic improvements. And you know, if I think back to the very first presentation that we heard here yesterday um, and talking about a full cycle and how everybody has to win, I think that's really where this beef on dairy conversation is. It's a win, win, win for everybody. Um, we've, we've got uh, calf rearers that want healthy calves, and, and I'll leave that for Cam to talk to, um, that they grow and perform well. And then we've got processors that want consistent supply, consistent product um, at consistent quality that, that's going to hit all the specs that they need all the way through the supply chain. So I think when I, when I think back to you know, dairy producers doing a really good job and realizing the economic impact of selecting the genetics for the top half of the herd, you know, it's a bit of a mindset shift now to, to look at the beef genetics on the other half of the herd and having that same economic impact. Um, I think you know, as we, we've looked at genomics, which has allowed us to identify the top half and the bottom half of the herd, um, that, that's really the biggest change that, that we've seen. Uh, yeah, I suppose we, we talk about the supply chain being, um, you know, price discovery and, and very segmented in its nature today. Uh, I think what we're starting to see, the mindset shift, as Brad um, speaks to in the bottom end of our herd, is that we've got an industry that on the milking side is very focused on what they need to achieve to meet their milk contract specs. And, and that's, you know, very common to how we run the dairy business. And we need to start to have that mindset on the bottom end of our herd around beef on dairy. Specifically, what we're starting to see is that um, our economic horizon um, is no longer going to be able to be in the aggregate. So for a dairy farmer, our economic horizon for a non-replacement animal is five days, seven days, maybe eight weeks. Very short economic horizon. So that kind of mindset going into our breeding programs is what drives our decisions around genetics. But what we're starting to see now is the demand from our needy consumers that Jess refers to, is that the economic horizon is now 24 months, 30 months. This is the impact and how powerful the genetic decisions that we make today at breeding um, are, and we're going to start to see that pressure ramp up um, in the years to come. So, and for a number of reasons, we need to start, as the individual stakeholders along the supply chain, our economic horizon, yes, is first and foremost for our own business where we sit within the supply chain, but it needs to take in consideration quite seriously the impacts of the next stakeholder within that supply chain, otherwise it just does not work. And traditionally that's what we've um, witnessed. 
And Jess, I'm going to expand on the question before I hand it to you as well. Um, one of the things that I've seen quite a bit lately, which I, I know you'll have opinions on, um, is I've had quite a few conversations with dairy farmers going, yep, we're, we're doing this beef on dairy thing. And, you know, we've really been having a think about, you know, what we might experiment with, which is great. Um, and, you know, some people might have been letting the kids pick some of the beef bulls because it's quite interesting to see what they come out looking like. And we've We've heard some stories of um, some Brahmin cross calves, some belted Galloways, some all sorts of kind of licorice, all sorts coming out from a processor perspective and, and long-term viability of these chains. What sort of impact does, you know, that sort of decision making have? Yeah, so I guess we've sort of got to stand back and, and look at the, the different points of the supply chain these animals are going to move through. So these decisions that are made on the farm, you know, there then needs to be somebody to take that animal on and, and background it and take it to a weight where somebody makes a decision of does it enter a feedlot, do we finish it on grass, how are we going to, you know, um, finish that animal to then get it through to the processor. And each of those people needs to see value in this animal to bring it through. Um, from a greening perspective, we try and work really, really closely with our breeders in the beef side um, because not just the genetics, but also the management decisions made impact our ability to market that animal. Um, and, and, you know, we've tried to have really open conversations, share data with those breeders and, and demonstrate market value for all different animals they're turning off, including their cow cows, so that we can, you know, be involved in that conversation. And I guess... Um, Historically, um, you know, what Sarah spoke to with, you know, beef market goes down and suddenly these dairy beef animals haven't been so desirable. Um, I think a lot of that reflects, um, you know, the lack of confidence in those producers in the middle and also in the processor around whether those animals are going to consistently meet the needs, whether they're going to be profitable, whether they're going to grow, and whether they're going to meet our market needs uh, at the other end. So, I do actually think we've got a really unique opportunity in this dairy space and I get quite excited about it because you are sitting there annually looking really closely at your genetics and what you're going to put in and what opportunities there are and we can have a really constructive conversation around, well, what is it that we need? Um, you know, we talk about things like sustainability and there's some great, um, you know, carbon, um, carbon footprint opportunities, resource efficiency opportunities that we can get from the dairy animal to create... Um, appetite from a beef animal, uh, a beef farmer to want to pull those animals through. But getting the right genetics in and having them see that this is going to be a profitable animal in their business and it's going to fit into their end market is super, super important because as Green and we want to get involved in that conversation and in the, in the you know, short to midterm, we have an appetite to you know, own calves and, and build demand and, and demonstrate through data that these animals can perform. But long term, we 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 can't own all these animals, right? Um, you know, we've got a board that's going to direct how we invest our money and I, I don't think they'll be wanting us to have ownership of however many surplus calves there are, you know, 800,000 calves. So, you know, we need a beef industry to see value in these animals and want to have them in their farm um, to finish and, and, you know, send those animals to market at a profit. So on the topic of, um, I guess, the genetic makeup of these calves, there's a lot of people in the room that will know that I'm a bit of an advocate for the Jersey beef side of things, and I know Glenn Barrett's in the room. Um, but a great question from Mark Billing is, you know, is there a place for the Jersey bull calf um, in dairy beef supply chains? And I'll expand on that um, and ask the question of when it comes to a herd that has either purebred Jersey or Holstein Jersey cows, what are our options? Yeah, great question. I think, um, you know, back to the previous presentation, present presentation um, showing your book uh, pictures, I'm going to maybe go back in time a little bit here too and, and talk about how the beef has been used over time. And beef has always been a, a reproductive tool for, for dairies. Um, you know, historically it was used to get those, those cows that were far in lactation pregnant that have maybe been serviced a number of times. And it was used, it was looked at as, as just a cheap way to get these cows pregnant one last time. Um, and it, it evolved as the genomic conversation happened. It evolved into um, using it as a reproductive tool to manage heifer inventories. Um, and, you know, there wasn't, you know, initially there wasn't a ton of value placed on the kind of cattle that we were used. Um, just really, how do we get these calves off the farm faster and, and lower our heifer inventories and, and pull out some of the costs that they have to raise these calves. But what we're seeing now is, 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 how do we get more value out of these calves and create a more valuable product? Um, and I think the, the Jersey and, and Holstein Jersey conversation is, is a perfect place to go with this. 
And I think what we're going to see here in the very near future is an evolution from conventional semen into sorted male semen on the beef side of things. And, you know, looking a little bit further out into the crystal ball, I do see the opportunity for embryos to come into play as well. And I think, um, you know, when we start talking about using some of these jerseys and, and Holstein jersey crosses as, as potential recepts um, to create straight beef type calves, uh, I think is going to be a huge opportunity for, for calf rearers and, and processors to, again, to get the consistency and get the value out of these cattle. And before we go along for further questions, just on that topic, you know, you've very lightly touched on what is really quite a big idea, which is the concept of putting purebred beef embryos into dairy cows. How soon do you think that will be taken up with any sort of scale? Yeah, great question. So it's, uh, it's something that we're doing now in North America, um, and it's something that we're, we're working out, rolling out across other global markets. So I do think it's right on the horizon um, and, you know, something that's potentially going to change the game, I think, as far as um, genetic advancement. Um, we've already seen significant genetic advancement by looking at um, one bull compared to another as far as their genetic value um, and, and looking at what we can do with embryos is, is just the next step in evolution. So in the year 20... I'm not going to put a date on it here today. I, I don't want to get shot here when I'm sitting on stage. So. Cam, um, in terms of Jersey and Holstein Jersey cows... Yeah, I look at the elephant in the room. What we do with this um, section of the market? I mean, from 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 my from my lens, looking at, at the overall supply chain, as much as we don't want to hear it, um, I can't place that animal into a market that's got an e economic outcome for the stakeholders. It's just the hard reality of it today. And is that purebred or beef cross? Uh, well, um, uh, the purebred Holstein steer, I think, is problematic. Um, we're not seeing. Globally, we're not seeing the trend going into Holstein steers. We've seen a massive trend coming out of the Holstein steers. If you look across the um, North American platform, there is the bulk of the feed yards now have made the transition out, out of that back from 2016. Um, I, I'm not sure that I, I think the Austra our industry in Australia um, has the luxury of where we are in this transition to not make those kind of probably early mistakes to think that we can take that Holstein steer down the supply chain and have some economic viability in it. I think it's got, got too much risk around it. And so, Jess, if I'm running a herd entirely of Jersey cows, what are my options for working with um, a company like Greenham? Yeah, so I think, um, I think what we need to do is look firstly at the markets because, you know, we think of something like, you know, a Jersey animal and think, great, there's some excellent eating quality that can be achieved through that animal, we're getting great marbling, that's fantastic, but we've got to look to where Australia sort of sits in the export beef market and where we're attracting the most value for the animals we produce. Um, and that, you know, Greenham really try and play in the premium beef space, so that's something that we do day in, day out. And eating quality is absolutely paramount. But then, you know, when we take that animal to the market, um, there's a whole lot of other factors that we need to consider. And if we're thinking back at the farm around, say, a Jersey bull calf, for example, um, how we're going to get that animal through the supply chain, we're going to have potentially, you know, slower weight gains, which is going to add cost throughout that animal's life. Then we're going to have a lighter carcass, and it costs the same amount for us to process that animal at the plant, but we get a whole lot less meat off it, which means, um, you know, higher cost per kilogram for the meat in terms of the production cost and less uh, throughput and efficiency for the plant because they can also only process so many animals. We've only got so many hooks and, and so on and so forth. So uh, what we're doing is we're limiting the ability for that company that's taking that animal in to get um, profitable meat out the other end and we've added costs through the supply chain. So we've sort of got to sit there and say to justify that really high cost um, per kilogram that that animal's just had, we've got to hit sky, sky high with that meat price. We have really, really strong beef brands that do attract um, really high premiums. Um, and I think, you know, what we really need to do is look at say, well, how do we achieve that and how do we do it with an animal that can grow and make that guy in the middle and the processor around production cost um, make that money? So what's the jersey missing? In this case, you know, it's missing that carcass yield and it's missing that growth, but it's got some great eating quality. So how do we look at what we match it with from a genetic component, maybe down the track when we get to embryos, awesome. Um, but in, in between, how do we get the right bull that's going to um, give that animal the growth and the carcass yield that it's lacking because it's got great eating quality? And, and I, 
I, I think just to add to that, just before we leave the topic, I think both of you guys touched on something that I want to elaborate a little bit more on. You know, as I mentioned, embryos is the future of where we're going, and, and Jess just alluded to the fact that we got to do something in between. We need to understand what it is that we're working with, and you know, I think you know, as Jess mentioned on on the jerseys, the eating quality and the marbling ability of jerseys is is really exceptional, um, and and the marbling ability on Holsteins is also quite good. Jerseys will outperform them a little bit as far as marbling, um, but both of those breeds have exceptional marbling. And as Jess also alluded to, it's the it's the cutability or the volume of meat that we can get off of each of these animals that's the issue. So in the meantime, as we're talking about what do we do with these Jersey bull calves, it's about pairing them up with, with the best genetics that we can to be able to get the most outcome. Um, no different, again, than what we're doing on the top half of our, our our dairies and understanding what are our deficiencies and what is it that's driving profitability. If we're low in protein and low in fats, we're looking at sires to try to increase protein and increase fats. In this scenario, we've, we've got a cow herd that's really good at marbling, so we don't have to go quite as hard on selection for marbling, but we do need to look at improving the cutability and improving the yield grade that we get out of these cattle. So if I was comparing jerseys and, and Holsteins together, you know, I would go a little bit more aggressive on a jersey program to get a little bit more muscle shape, a little bit more, uh, I was about to say eye, um, rib eye, but, but here we call the eye of muscle. Um, and um, just to get more of that yield. Whereas on the dairy genetics, where we got a little bit more frame, a little bit more growth, um, they do have a little bit more performance, we can cut back on that slightly um, to try to, to limit how much marbling we're gonna give up uh, as we go heavier on the muscling. And I think that feeds really nicely into a question that I often get asked, which is, you know, and particularly in my former role at Dairy Australia, which is why can't we just create a new market that's going to magically pay us a premium for every single surplus calf that, that we breed on our farms? And, and I think what this panel is really speaking to is that markets for these animals exist. The challenge is in how we breed, feed and manage them according to, you know, market specs that are out there. So I, I think the take home message from, from this part of the conversation is that it really has to go both ways. We don't need to create magic new markets. They, they are there and, and there are commercial players willing to take them. Um, but we have to be working to produce quality articles in the same way that we do for the milk that's produced on farms as well. Um, and so I guess in trying to complete this conversation around the idea of decision making, there's a great question from Anthony Shelley, which is, with the value horizon pushing out to 24 to 30 months, how does a producer capture this value through their investment in genetics? So effectively, when we have a calf try or potentially changing hands, um, leaving the dairy farm to be reared by someone else, uh, to be backgrounded by another person, to be finished by another, and then hitting the processor, this, what we've discussed is that there can be a huge effect in terms of the genetic makeup of that animal and how it performs with each one of those stakeholders along the supply chain. But how do we actually incentivize that good decision making all the way back at the other end of the chain? Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, it's my belief that, that the supply chain idea is something that's going to be a, a have to have in the future. Um, we're starting to see it somewhat in, in some of the European markets. Um, you know, we've talked about it a lot at this conference here over the last two days, too, about your social license and ability to produce milk. Uh, we're starting to see some milk processors say, we need to have uh, a useful life for these calves. We need to have a purpose for these calves. And I think that's where we're seeing these supply chains starting to emerge to say, okay, here is our opportunity and here is the useful life for this calf. And, and again, back to the win-win-win conversation, we're able to produce um, you know, a glass of milk out of the same cow that's produced, providing the uterus to, to produce a, a kilo of protein. Um, so I think when we start looking at our greenhouse emissions and the environmental side of things as well, you know, the conversation is that if we're going to lower our carbon footprint by everybody's talking about 2030, we got to start doing this now. And, and again, if, if we're talking about a social license and an ability to produce milk, produce protein, um, you know, I think this is a huge opportunity to say the baseline is what we've been doing for the last number of years. Our opportunity to lower that baseline is by using the same cow to do both things. 
um, I, I think there's a huge opportunity there. The other side of the supply chain, um, and maybe Jess can talk to this a little bit more in a minute, um, but what we're seeing in a lot of different markets, and, and Australia just came through a huge drought. And that drought, you know, eliminated a lot of cows and, and the total cow herd inventory is, is quite low. We're seeing the same thing in North America. So if we got Australia in, in somewhat all-time lows and North America currently in an all-time low of cattle inventories, native cattle inventories, um, what these supply chains need when we're talking about the large retailers that are the, the face of, of where these, this food's being consumed, they need consistent supply of product. Um, and, you know, if one thing's taught us over the last couple of years with, with COVID is that these supply chains can be broken and, and we really, really need to have continuous supply of a product all the way right through to the end. So I, I do see a, a future in the very, very near future that, you know, it's, it's not going to be a, it'd be nice to be in a supply chain and it'd be nice to get a premium for our product. We're going to have to be in the supply chain in order to sell our cattle, in order to sell our milk, um, and have that social license to produce. And Cam, I'm going to come back to you on the topic of carbon footprinting and a, and a large-scale global you know, food company sure. as well. But in the meantime, um, just completing this idea around how uh, you know, the entire supply chain can reward good behaviour back at the level of the dairy farm, um, but also incorporating into that a question that came through um, with regard to a lack of forward price contracts that are available for calves. So are you able to speak to how that sort of loop can be completed? Yeah, certainly. So, yeah, from that idea of supply chains, I think certainly, you know, if you're making these decisions and, and wanting to make sure that these animals are fit for market and they're going to have that pull through along the supply chain, uh, getting pretty close to that end market is really valuable. Um, from, from our perspective, um, we do extend our accreditation programs right back to the dairy farm, um, back to the rearer, because we make a whole lot of different raising claims um, on pack and it's really, really important to the customers buying our product and paying you know, very significant premiums for that product, that there is that lifetime traceability and that any claims that made on pack are verified right back on farm. Um, what those accreditation programs do is they provide you with an opportunity to be in a constant conversation with that end market, even if they're not the point that you're selling to. Um, from our perspective, you know, we're, we've really spent the last couple of years uh, piloting and establishing this program. It's starting to become reasonably established uh, down in Tasmania where we launched it. And, and this year we're really hoping to um, grow and build a supply chain, um, you know, in, in Victoria and in, in Southern Australia. Um, so we'll be looking to um, establish, you know, pricing grids that do give those signals through to, you know, the genetic decisions you make, the program eligibility, um, you know, ability to, um, you know, uh, manage and, and minimise antibiotic usage and, and those sorts of things because that gives us more flexibility around how we market the product. Um, we're hoping by establishing that um, and also establishing pricing grids for these animals back at slaughter that that will signal to our beef supply chain that, you know, this is where the value is in these animals and, and create each one of those sort of members along the supply chain to recognise um, that value and, and have a consistent method of, of um, communicating and rewarding that back at the dairy farm level, regardless of whether farmers are interested in forward contracting or, or being a little more exposed to the market and, and you know, um, have that greater appetite for risk. Um, we'll definitely have a proportion of our calves that we can you know, provide forward contracts to so that farmers who are wanting confidence at the joining or, or at birth of those animals before you make significant investment can have that. Um, but I see long term that's not going to make up the bulk of this. It'll be really about establishing and demonstrating across the supply chain where that value is so that everyone understands you know, what they're paying for and, and where premiums could be established. And so on the topic of carbon accounting, so we know that there is, you know, the basic maths behind these animals that according to the International Dairy Federation methodology, the majority of a dairy cow's emissions for the year are allocated to her milk production. And we have the minority being allocated to her dairy beef calf in comparison to a beef cow whose entire annual emissions are allocated to her beef calf. So at the point in time that a beef calf from a beef cow hits the ground in comparison to a dairy beef calf from a dairy cow, that dairy beef animal is entering the world with a much lower carbon footprint than its purebred beef counterpart. And of course, a lot of variables can come into play, you know, as, as these animals enter production systems. But Cam, in your role working with one of the world's largest um, 
uh, food service companies. How important is that carbon piece going to be and how do we utilise that to our advantage when working with the Australian beef sector to integrate these animals in a sustainable way? Yeah, I mean, it's a fairly big question to answer, <laughs> that one. Sarah. So, um, look, I, I, just before I get to the sustainability piece, I'll go back a, a little bit to marketing these beef animals because that's essentially um, where this all comes from. And it's basically, you know, marketing 101 is service a market that already exists and let's not go and create another one. So the reality is is that we are starting to see these big markets start to be immobilised understand in, within Australia, understand what this beef on dairy animal can do. And that's essentially some of the work that I'm doing at the minute to help immobilise those markets so that you guys can see them. The sustainability piece is that the beef on dairy animal comes with a significant carbon footprint reduction than the native beef on beef animal, day one. We know that. But what happens is if where the influence and the variability in, in, in that um, surplus, um, so to speak, that we've got day one is that if we use the wrong genetics and we overlay poor management onto that animal, we end up with an animal that is far greater of a carbon footprint than the native beef on beef herd. So from our end, right up the other end of the supply chain, um, we're looking at, we know what the markets are and we know what the market specs are, as does, as does Jess, and we're saying, okay, we need to get an animal to that spec um, in the shortest amount of time because that allows us to retain the free hit of carbon reduction that we've got day one. And we can chew that up very quickly when the animal starts to get from 12 months onwards in poor management and poor genetics. So if we're thinking about poor management, which is essentially feed quality, how we've read the calf, you know, if we start to blow out days on feed and, and start to push into the 24, 26, 27 months before we, um, before we harvest the animal, then there's no carbon realised. How important is this for the big global supply chains? It is extremely important um, because they have all signed up for 2030, 2050 targets. Those targets are all about attracting product into their supply chain with less scope three emissions. And it's our responsibility in the producer level to be creating products that have a less scope three emissions. And so simply what this means in the long term is that if we're both selling eggs and Jess's eggs have more scope three emissions than mine, market access is going to be a lot difficult for Jess than mine. So we're, the, way that we're, we're, the way that we're looking at these big beef on dairy supply chains now are to make sure that we've got our genetics correct, we've got our management practices correct in a playbook, and then we can then go out to the marketplace and, and really start to drive and stimulate the um, big supply chains to get up and running. And, and just to add to that, just to add how close we're getting to 2030, because we, we keep referencing 2030, the, the bulls that are being born today are the sires of the progeny that we're going to harvest in 2028, 2029. So, so just keep that in mind when we're talking about we're going to lower our carbon footprint by 2030, those decisions really need to have been made before today, or at least, at the very least, when we leave this room. And I just to flesh that out a little bit on the sustainability, the financial sector is also very interested to make sure that we've got scope three product that is low because their financial risk management and ESG credentials demand that as well. And I think it's important we acknowledge the financial sector as an important stakeholder in this conversation as well. So one of the huge challenges that we have in working on this issue is that when we talk about the broad range of stakeholders that we need to work with, yes, there's a supply chain from genetics company, dairy farm, car fare, background, a finisher, meat processor, milk processor, procurement, the finance sector is in there as well, but also remembering that, you know, and with my animal welfare researcher hat on, the animals themselves are a stakeholder in this too, as well as the general public and making sure that we're aligning with those values. So this is a hugely complex challenge for us, which underpins that important role of collaboration. But I think, Jess, you looked like you had one last thing to add to the carbon oh, conversation. I guess simply just like, you know, there is an, um, a goal for the um, red meat industry that we do achieve, you know, carbon neutrality in 2030. So CN30, um, which means that, you know, both producers and supply chains are looking at ways to deliver that. So in our own supply chain, you know, we've been uh, developing a beef sustainability standard and under that is, you know, an entire carbon management component that takes our farmers on a, 
a sort of a initial point of learning all about this on farm and ways they can influence it through to doing their carbon account, uh, identifying strategies, and then sort of aiming for, for that goal of neutrality or, or a much lower emissions intensity. Um, this is a really big opportunity for beef on dairy cattle. With that lower footprint, you know, work has been done to start to integrate that, uh, you know, dairy beef advantage into the calculator for those sourced animals. But again, as Cam said really well, for that to be realised and for farmers to have the confidence in buying those animals as, you know, um, one of those methods they're going to reduce their carbon footprint, they have to perform, they have to grow, and they're going to have to meet, you know, that market specification at the end for that economic sustainability as well. Thanks, Jess. So I think I've been pretty gentle on you all so far. So with three minutes left, I'm going to ask each of you to give me one sentence on what your take-home message for the crowd is and one sentence on what does the future look like. And you can have 10 seconds of thinking time or you can each put up your hand when you're ready, but one sentence on each if you can to round out the discussion. I went first every other time, so I think it's somebody else's okay. turn here. You, you I'm going to go handle it. All right, I'm going to keep it really simple with every beef genetic decision you make, just think about the market and think about, you know, where that animal might go and, and how it can uh, be as valuable as possible. And what does the future look like? Oh, the future. Sorry. I must have tuned out. Um, I think the future is really exciting, um, but I guess I'm not a geneticist, but um, from our perspective, I do see, um, you know, and beef on dairy animals is becoming a really significant proportion of what we do process. Um, and, you know, having those animals uh, achieve equivalent, if not, you know, better results than some of our beef supply chain and playing a really significant role uh, in, you know, servicing our global customers and providing high quality beef. That was a very long sentence. Sorry. Uh, Cam or Brad, take home message and what does the future look like? Uh, so the future is positive and I can, it's going to be a large proportion of what we do in the Australian dairy industry and globally. So that's not going away. And, and the take-home message would be within your individual herds or as a service provider or a genetics company, make sure that you can identify the proportion within your client's inventory that needs to go to beef and please make sure that the right decision has a market focus on it, start, middle and end. That's all I can – we can't stress that enough. I'm identifying a theme, Brad. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, just the amount of work that's been done to date um, on genetic improvement and the data that we're seeing on, the, on this genetic improvement is astonishing. But I think we're, we're really on the edge of the cliff as far as how much more is going to be done on the genetic space um, to move this forward. And, and that leads into where I think the future is going to go. You know, I think we're, we're at a point where we're going to be, um, you know, really pigeonholed into what we can use for genetics um, to be able to fit the entire very segmented beef supply chain. But I think, again, we've got an opportunity here to make that segmented supply chain seamless and it, it, it'll be um, very beneficial and win-win-win for, for everybody in the supply chain. Fabulous. Please join me in thanking our excellent panel members. Good work.